Good evening, everyone. So today we are going to continue with our um, lecture on antibiotics. Um, we have one more lecture. So hopefully by the end of this week, with our next lecture on Wednesday, we should be able to finish antibiotics. The rest would be faster. So we'll go to antivirals, antifungals, and antimalarials and the others. Okay. This is the largest group of medication. We are going to spend a lot of time on the anti-infectives. The rest, like the cardiovascular and the other things, we won't do so much or dwell so much on them. So we we'll look at, so the outline is more than cephalosporins. We we'll look at cephalosporins, we we'll look at the encosamides and then, uh, so, the cephalosporins, I'm sure those of us in clinical practice, we've heard of ketraxone, kefiroxime, kefipim, all those are cephalosporins. So cephalosporins are a group of antibiotics that are grouped into generations according to their effectiveness against different organisms. And also according to when they were developed. So you have the first generation order of their development. And also they have some peculiar characteristics that puts them in um, groups according to their generation. So the first of the cephalosporins, we have kefadroxyl, kefazolin sodium, and kefalexin monohydrate. The commonest one I've seen is kefalexin. I'm not too familiar with the others in our setting. Second generation kefalosporins include the kefaclor, kefroxyl, kefod Kef, kef, azetyl and kefiroxime sodium. Commonest in our setting is kefiroxime, um, which we commonly refer to as zinat, but we also have kefrox and azacef, also generics of the kefiroxime. Third generation kefalosporins include the kefdine, kefixime, kefroxetil, keftaxidim, and keftibutim and then keftriazone. So the commonest and most popular is keftriazone, which is an injection. So usually what we do, especially in pediatrics, is that when we start the treatment with the keftriazone, which is an injection, let's say a patient recovers, you want to send him on an oral medication. Then you would give either kefodoxine or kefixine. So kefodoxine is commonly called orilox. And kefixine is called biozyme. That's the commonest um, brands that are available. So you send the patient on these because you want to continue with the efficacy of the kephalosporin. So having started with a, an injection, you want to send them on a, an oral medication. And the fourth generation Mommy, kephalosporins are... No, please. Uh, kefix. Kef, kefipim hydrochloride. So um, we know that the penicillins are chemically similar to the kephalosporins because they have um, the beta lactam molecular structure. And this occurs in about 10 to 15% of patients. So sometimes if a patient has a reaction to penicillin, there's a 10 to 15% chance that they also react to Kephalosporin. So sometimes you have to be aware of this when patient has an allergy to uh, penicillin. So many of the kephalosporins are administered parenterally. That is GM, IV or IM, um, because most of them cannot be absorbed from the GI. But the ones that are absorbed from the GI are given orally. And it is known that food usually decreases their rate of um, absorption, with the exception of kefiroxime and kefodoxime. So kefiroxime is commonly zinat, and kefodoxime is commonly known as orilox. So with the exception of these two, the rest, you usually give them either one hour before meals or two hours after meals. But these ones can be given with food because it's been noticed that the absorption is increased with food. So after absorption, they are widely distributed and readily cross the placenta. So if you, you can use it to treat a uh, fetal infection as well. So um, 
can protect them, can them, can transit them. They cross the blood-brain barrier. So this tells you that they can be used for um, for meningitis. Then kefitim also crosses the blood-brain barrier. So by metabolism, they are not metabolized at all. Um, so what it says is that it means that they are not changed in the body. But however, kefotaxin is metabolized into a form that is less active. And um, to a small extent, some of them are metabolized in the intestine. And then they come out through the biliary system and are excreted in the stools. For the excretion, like I said, because they are not metabolized, a lot of them are unchanged <coughs> and excreted in the kidney, with the exception of the ketral zone, which, like we said, is excreted in the bile and then comes out in the stool. So the way they work is by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. So their action is similar to that of penicillin. And we know that the penicillin bind to the enzyme called penicillin binding protein, a protein called penicillin binding protein on the cell membrane, which causes disruption of the cell membrane and allows the microorganism, the antibiotic to enter and disrupt the microorganism. And so this is how the cephalosporins also do their work. When you look at the various cephalosporins, each generation has something peculiar about it. So if you take the first generation cephalosporins, they are mainly active against gram-positive organisms. And you can use them as an alternative to patients who are allergic to penicillin. But you need to bear in mind that 10 to 15% of these patients would also have a cause reactivity. So you may try them, but don't be surprised that they would have a um, reaction. And so typically the gram-positive organisms that uh, would cause infections for which the third generation cephalosporins are active against are the staph and the strep infection. So um, osteomyelitis, skin, and soft tissue infection, pneumonia, which is caused by streptococcus. So moving to the second, so, so to summarize, the peculiar thing about first-generation cephalosporins is that they are active against gram-positive organisms. When you come to the second generation, they are active against gram-negative organisms. But then kefotzitin is active against anaerobes, okay? Then the third generation cephalosporins, they are active against gram-negative organisms as well. And they are mostly used when you are thinking of Enterobacter, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and then anaerobes. Then the fourth generation are good against both gram-positive and gram-negative. So first generation gram-positive, second generation gram-negative. Third generation gram negative, typically Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, and anaerobic organisms. And then fourth generation is both. So when you look at adverse reactions, you can have all these occurring seizures, confusion. As for nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, it seems like they are universal reactions. So if I ask you for side effects of cephalosporin, I don't expect to see nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So you've been warned before you come and write it. Hey. In fact, if you write it, I'll pin it. So take note of it. I mean, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, any antibiotic you take will give you that. So take note of the peculiar things. You see? Confused. Uh, um, this one is a bonus, bonus, bonus. It's not, it's a bonus. I mean, I've told you. So it's like, <laughs> I've told you. So we can a bonus. Okay. <laughs> so you realize that I mentioned bleeding. And typically, the triazone is associated with increased risk of bleeding. And so if you have a patient who is at risk of maybe liver disease, or has a problem with vitamin K synthesis because we know that um, vitamin K is responsible for the synthesis of some clotting factors. 
So a patient with such a problem or a patient with renal impairment, you have to be careful when you're giving keftriaxone because of the increased risk of bleeding. And um, hypersensitivity reactions are also very common with cephalosporin. So you can have itching, you can have hives, you can have a measles type reaction, serum sickness, and anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction whereby there's difficulty breathing, there's wheezing, throat constriction. It's similar to an asthmatic attack. So when you are talking about drug react interactions, cephalosporins are very notorious for interactions with alcoholic beverages. So actually, when you look at interaction between alcohol and medication, the notorious ones are cephalosporins and then the um, flagell. We'll talk about flagell later on. <clears throat> so note that even as, as much as 72 hours after, taking the medication. The patients will have serious symptoms of acute alcohol intolerance, like headache, like flashing, like dizziness, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps within 30 minutes of an alcohol injection. So please, it's very important for you to warn patients about mixing alcohol with medication because it can be that bad. And this reaction can occur even up to three days after discontinuing the antibiotic. Okay, this is very, very important. Then medications that relieve gout can reduce the excretion of cephalosporin. So what this means is that if you give the medication that um, is used to relieve gout, in addition to the cephalosporin, the cephalosporin will stay in the system for a longer period. It's also important to note this same interaction with estrogen containing um, oral contraceptives. So decrease efficacy. So they need to use alternative contraceptives when they are on the oral contraceptive because there's decreased absorption and this decreases the efficacy. Okay. So to summarize the drug interactions, mainly has to do with the medications used to treat gout and then oral contraceptives. I know that it's a lot to take in for the various classes, remembering the peculiar things. You don't need to stress too much. The most important thing is to have a BNF and just to be aware of some of these things. If you are not sure, it's always important to cross check. So we we'll look at the tetracyclines. So tetracyclines are broad spectrum antibiotics. They may be classified as intermediate acting compounds. Example is dimiclocycline, and then the long acting one is doxycycline and minocycline. Um, typically, we do not prescribe tetracyclines in pregnant women and then also in pediatrics, children below eight years because of the potential for staining the teeth yellow. And so this is something that you should have at the back of your mind. Um, they are taken orally and then they are absorbed from the small intestine. Once they are absorbed, they are distributed widely into body tissues. There's no restriction as to where they can go. But primarily you realize that they are concentrated in bile and they are excreted by the kidneys, and doxycycline can also be excreted in the stool. You don't like the thing. You just get the egg. Okay. Okay. Last one. Okay. So, um, they are mostly bacteriostatic. If you recall from our previous lecture, bacteriostatic antibiotics are those that um, would not completely kill the bacteria. They will slow down its growth and multiplication. The back, on the other hand, the bactericidal ones are the ones that will kill the bacteria. And how tetracyclines work is by inhibiting the growth or multiplication of the bacteria. So they penetrate the cell wall and then they bind to a subunit of the ribosome 
we know that ribosomes are involved in protein synthesis. So when they bind to the subunit of the ribosome, they inhibit protein synthesis. And we know that protein synthesis is important for the survival of the cell. So this would gradually decrease the growth and the multiplication of the bacteria, but it doesn't completely kill them. So they are active against gram positive and gram negative aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. So, but you realize that they are usually used to treat atypical bacteria, the spirochytes. Um, an example of an infection caused by spirochytes is syphilis. Then you have mycoplasma, rickettsia, chlamydia, and some protozoa. Um, so these are the atypical organisms that tetracyclines are mostly used to treat. So these are some of the infections. And take note of non gonococcal urethritis. So a man comes with um, whitish um, urethral discharge from the penis, and you are suspecting gonorrhea. If you send for a swab, it comes out chlamydia. Your best option is either to give tetracycline or doxycycline. So a lot of the time, you realize in clinical practice, Patients coming in with that discharge will be given, will be, will be asked to do the swab. And whilst waiting for the results, we'll be given a combination of tetracycline and then ciprofloxacin. So the ciprofloxacin will handle the gonococcus. And then the chlamydia and the urea plasma, which can cause the non gonococcal urethritis, is handled by the tetracycline or the doxycycline. In low dose, it can be used to treat acne. Um, so drug interactions, they also reduce the effectiveness of hormonal contraceptives, and they can lead to breakthrough bleeding. And um, as usual, with all this ineffectiveness, the patient should have a backup, because otherwise, they can have failure of the contraception. And when you take the tetracycline with penicillin, it decreases the bactericidal action of the penicillin. And things like magnesium antacid will reduce the absorption of oral tetracycline. So let's say the patient is taking, um, mommy, please tell Kevin I said you should fry one egg for me. Hmm? Tell Kevin I said you should fry one egg for me, okay? Yes, please. Oh. Okay, so um, the antacids will reduce the absorption of oral tetracycline. Then, if you have zinc sulfate, they also reduce the absorption. So, when you have these drug interactions, it means that ideally you should um, separate the ingestion of these medications by at least two to three hours. So, for example, if the patient is, let's say, having abdominal pain, you've given an antacid, and you've also prescribed maybe tetracycline for something else, that advice of separating them by two to three hours should come. Otherwise, your antibiotic may not become effective. Then, um, medications like carbamazepine and phenytoin, barbiturates, which are used to treat epilepsy can increase the metabolism um, of the, of the, the, the tetracycline, and this will reduce the antibiotic effect. So increasing the metabolism means that the medication will be broken down quickly, and then the effects that you expect it to have in the body will be decreased. So adverse, by way of adverse reactions, um, the usual <laughs> nausea, vomiting, I've told you. This Our one. favorite phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that everybody cares about them. <laughs> yeah, stuck. And you want to tell the patient some of the side effects to expect. I mean, normally every antibiotic if it runs across nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, distension, diarrhea, for the ones that are taken orally, all these side effects runs across. So you can just tell the patient some of the side effects, like these ones. 
But what I'm saying is that for an exam, I expect you to talk about the ones which are not nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, distension, diarrhea. So if you look at tertiary cycling, they cause photosensitivity. So you have a rash on the exposed areas of the skin. So like if you, the patient wears short sleeves, the arms and the face, the pleasure areas, those places then which are exposed, you would have rashes over that place. So it's important when a patient complains of a rash, look at the distribution. Are they on the sun exposed areas? Is it possible that it is photosensitive rash? Then um, renal toxicity, liver toxicity. Um, just to cast your mind back, aminoglycosides are also associated with renal toxicity. So gentamicin, amikacin, they are also um, culprits for renal toxicity. So let's look at interaction with food. So um, milk and milk, milk products are also a no-no because they bind with the tetracycline and prevent the absorption. So we already realized that antacids are not to be taken. Milk, milk products should also not be taken. Um, but however, minocycline and doxycycline, you can take them with these because they don't interact that way. Um, so tetracycline is the one that you shouldn't take with milk and milk products. So either you take it one hour before meals or two hours after meals, hoping that by then the stomach will be empty of the milk and the milk products. So the last thing we'll talk about are lincomycin derivatives. So lincomycin derivatives, the prototype is clindamycin, but we also have um, lincomycin itself. If you don't remember anything at all about clindamycin, I want you to remember um, pseudomembranous colitis. Okay, so um, this group of antibiotics, they have a high potential for causing serious adverse effects. Clindamycin is a prototype, like I said already. And because of the potential for serious adverse effects, you usually don't just get up and prescribe it. You will use it when there's no other alternative, no other therapeutic alternative. And it covers mostly gram-positive and anaerobic organisms. So take note of the anaerobic. Um, if you take the class, the lincomycin is less effective than clindamycin. Clindamycin, sorry, and it's rarely used. Um, it shouldn't be used for minor infections, but for serious respiratory or skin infections in a patient who is allergic to other antibiotics. Okay. So if you look at the pharmacokinetics, clindamycin can be taken orally, it can be taken IV. When you take it orally, it is absorbed well and it is distributed widely throughout the body. It is metabolized by the liver, is excreted by the kidneys and biliary pathways. So you realize that the metabolism by the liver and the kidneys are running through. And that tells you that generally as a rule for most antibiotics or most medications actually, if a patient has a renal problem, or the patient has a liver problem, you have to exercise caution when you are giving those antibiotics. So these are general rules of prescribing the prescription writing. So when it comes to lincomycin, it can also be taken orally. But however, when it is taken orally, you realize that only 20 to 30 percent of it is absorbed from the GI tract. Unlike lincomycin, which is absorbed very well. And the absorption of lincomycin is delayed by food. It is partly metabolized in the liver. And so it comes out in the bile and also urine and so. So how do they work? They both inhibit bacterial protein synthesis and they bind to the ribosomes and then inhibit the protein synthesis in this respect. And so at therapeutic concentrations, they are primarily bacteriostatic. It means that they slow down the growth of 
multiplication of the bacteria. They don't kill the bacteria. So here again, we are going to reiterate the potential for causing serious toxicity. And what they cause is called pseudomembranous colitis. Now these drugs are um, therefore limited to few clinical situations in which safer um, alternatives are not available. Thank you. Go and say thank you to Kevin. Put it down and go and say thank you to Kevin. So um, they are only limited to the few clinical situations where there's no alternative. And what is the pseudomembranous uh, colitis? It is characterized by severe diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, mucus, and blood in the stool. So if so in this case, when you prescribe clindamycin, you should warn the patient about these side effects. The severe diarrhea, the abdominal pain, the fever, the mucus and the blood in the stool. And um, mucus and blood in the stool, it sort of mimics dysentery. Mommy, so, please put your leg in my place. Ah, but it's for me. Let me finish my lecture. So you realize that a patient could come in, complain of mucus, blood in the stool, fever, abdominal pain, and you think, oh, this patient has dysentery. Then you prescribe medication. If you don't take a good drug history, you wouldn't know that this patient may have been on clindamycin, and this actually is pseudomembranous colitis. So every aspect of the history is very, very important. So what are the things that we use clindamycin to treat? So we use clindamycin to treat gram-positive um, infections. So staphylococcus, streptococcus, pneumococci. You realize that there are other alternatives to these um, infections. So you only use clindamycin when you are pushed to the wall. Now clindamycin is also effective against anaerobes. So actually, this is the specialty or the special area of clindamycin. So if you have pulmonary infections or pleural infections, which are caused by the anaerobic bacteria, bacteroides flagellus, then this would be a good um, a good antibiotic to use. And it's also helpful in the treatment of Clostridium perfringis infection. So um, this is the organism that causes gas gangrene. So if you have that infection, clindamycin is also very good. And in a patient who is allergic to penicillin, clindamycin can also be an alternative. And this can be fatal. So you have to have a high index of suspicion and actually be very aggressive with your fluid and electrolyte management. Otherwise, the patient could, you could actually lose the patient. And they can also have diarrhea and they can have stomatitis, which is inflammation of the mouth, the usual nausea and vomiting and then hypersensitivity reaction. So, very important thing about clindamycin and lincomycin is their property of neuromuscular blockade. So, if you, let's say a patient is undergoing anesthesia and the patient is given a neuromuscular blocker, it will become worse. The neuromuscular blocking activity will be worsened or will be heightened or potentiated by clindamycin. And this can lead to profound respiratory depression. Because you know that when you um, block the muscular action, the diaphragm is a muscle which helps with respiration. That is the most dire consequence of neuromuscular blockage. And so when you have clindamycin and you are given a neuromuscular blocker, it enhances the action. And so it's very important for us to be aware of this. So I think this is the end. Yes, thank you. So just to summarize, I don't know if people were late, but just to summarize, we talked about cephalosporins, we talked about tetracyclines, and we talked about lincomycin derivatives. For the cephalosporins, there are various classes, and the classes have their peculiar characteristics and infections that are used to treat them. 
The common thing about cephalosporins is that they act similar to penicillin, so they are good against most gram positive organisms. Um, first generation gram positive, second generation gram negative, third generation gram negative, especially Enterobacter and Pseudomonas. Fourth generation, both gram positive and gram negative activity. And common thing about cephalosporins is that they have a tendency for bleeding. Then for the tetracyclines, they are bacteriostatic. They um, inhibit the ribosome. They are usually not prescribed for children below eight years and then in pregnant women. And they are used to treat um, non gonococcal um, urethritis. And other atypical organisms like mycoplasma, the spirochetes, and um, urea plasma, chlamydia. Um, if you take the lincosamide derivatives, prototype is clindamycin. The most serious thing I want you to remember about clindamycin is pseudomembranous colitis, which can present in a similar way like dysentery, mucus, fever and diarrhea and so it's important for you to be sure and treat aggressively because it can be fatal okay thank you are there any questions are there any questions we are outside hello 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 Questions, or it's all something we need to learn. So, <laughs> uh, yes, though. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Samuel, your hand is up. Oh, it's not Samuel. Oh, okay. It's just that my case. Doc. Yes. Uh, I just want to say that thank you for your for food the other day. Hey. I really enjoyed your food. Hey. Hello, Doc. Hello. Yes, Mabel. Please, if uh, clindamycin is not good for a uh, pregnant woman, what about lactating mothers? So it's tetracycline, no. It's tetracycline that I said is not good for pregnant women. Yes, that is what I'm talking about. Mm. So it's also not good for lactating mothers because um, it is, it's not indicated for children below eight years. So if it goes through the breast milk, that child is below eight, so it's still not a good alternative. Thank you very much. All right. Any others? Are we okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sure you are meeting a lot of the medications that you see commonly and you are now understanding a lot of things. So the importance of knowledge is to be able to apply. Okay, so if you are, let's say, in clinical practice, you're administering a medication and you realize that there are some drug interactions, you can kindly draw the attention of the prescriber to it in a very nice and gentle way. I'm sure they will take it in good faith. It's a good way to practice what you are learning. You don't just try and keep it in your room for exam purposes. You have to practice. How do you handle your food? Any more questions? <laughs> All right, so have a good night. We'll meet on Wednesday. All right, dog. Same time, 7 p.m. Bye-bye. Good night. I'll go say good night. I'll go say good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>